Let's begin this talk with a brief discussion of anatomy, particularly the mediastinum. The mediastinum extends from the thoracic inlet to the diaphragm, and it's often divided into at least three compartments, the anterior, the middle, and the posterior mediastinum. As radiologists, we often use the anterior surface of the heart and great vessels as the boundary between the anterior and middle mediastinum, while many of us use the anterior surface of the thoracic spine as the boundary between the middle and posterior mediastinum. We use these boundaries because they help divide differential diagnoses into nice manageable buckets for us as chest radiologists. That's also why if you were to see, say, read a surgical textbook, you might see slightly different definitions of boundaries between these three compartments because surgeons may be more interested in bucketizing things, not necessarily by differential diagnosis, but perhaps by a surgical approach. For this talk, we're going to be discussing the anterior mediastinum, who, which some people say is home to 50% of mediastinal masses. The anterior mediastinal space on an axial CT extends from the sternum to the anterior surface of the great vessels and heart, and it extends as far lateral as the internal mammary vessels. Before we figure out how to approach the diagnosis when we see an anterior mediastinal mass in imaging, we have to figure out what are all the possible diagnoses we need to consider in the first place. Disease usually arises from organs and cells that are existing within a particular anatomic region. So a good start in terms of creating a nice list of anterior mediastinal masses or disorders that can cause an anterior mediastinal mass um, may be to think about all the different constituents of the anterior mediastinum and the things that might arise if something goes wrong with one of these constituents. What are these constituents? Well, there's a lot of fat in the anterior mediastinum, some thymus, a little bit of lymphatic tissue, and a few embryologic rests. Anything pathologic um, most likely starts from one of these four entities. So what are things that can cause an anterior mediastinal mass when the fat constituent of anterior mediastinum goes wrong or goes bad? Um, well, lipomatosis is probably the most common answer. There are other things like lipomas and liposarcs, but they're very, very rare. So we'll put them aside for the purpose of this talk. Lipomas are interesting because they're a common um, disorder elsewhere in the body, but just not in the anterior mediastinum. What kind of anterior mediastinal masses might arise from the thymus? The thymus contains lots of different cell lines, and so we might want to think about this uh, one kind of cell line at a time. Lymphatic cell lines within the thymus can give rise to thymic hyperplasia as a cause of an anterior mediastinal mass. Thymic hy hyperplasia is the development of lymphoid follicles within the thymus. The lymphatic cell lines within a thymus could give rise to a thymic cyst, which is a congenital lesion that some people believe comes from a persistent thymopharyngeal duct. And the lymphatic cell lines within a thymus could give rise to thymic lymphoma. The fat within the thymus can give rise to an anterior mesonal mass known as a thymolipoma, while the neuroendocrine cells within a thymus could give rise to a thymic carcinoid. There are epithelial cells within the thymus which can give rise to low-grade neoplasm like thymoma or high-grade neoplasms like thymic carcinoma. The connective tissues um, within the thymus don't, aren't really known to give rise to any anterior mediastinal masses. Let's look at the lymphatic tissue within um, the anterior mediastinum. Um, those could um, lead to an anterior mediastinal mass caused by lymphoma or one uh, caused by lymphangioma, a benign tumor of the uh, lymphatic system. 
The embryologic rust within the anterior mediastinum can give rise to germ cell tumors. And there's lots of different types of germ cell tumors out there. But as a chest radiologist, we can usually get away with bucketizing all of these different types of germ cell tumors into just three buckets, seminomas, benign teratomas, and non-seminomatous germ cell tumors. So another way to kind of, um, um, kind of build out this list is to say that embryologic rests could give rise to anterior mediastinal masses caused by benign teratomas, seminomas, and non-seminomatous germ cell tumors. Now, there are a number of other things that could create an anterior mediastinal mass. Um, and these are things that are not um, derived not derived from the anterior mediastinum itself, but reflect a process that affects or involves the anterior mediastinal anterior mediastinum. Um, processes like a seroma, a hematoma, or an abscess, a morgagni hernia from the abdomen, a pericardiac cyst, pericardial cyst from the cardiac space, or a metastasis from somewhere else in the body. So we've gone through this kind of thought exercise and created something much more comprehensive than the four T's we learned in medical school. This list here, which is kind of a large list. Um, but don't worry, since we're going to show you how we can package things up nice and um, tight in just a few minutes, something that's usable in the reading room. But before we do that, let's just talk about how well the different imaging modalities we tend to use on a day-to-day -day basis work. How well do they do when it comes to identifying and diagnosing anterior mucinal masses? Starting with chest x-rays. Bottom line, chest x-rays are not that good. They're only good for recognizing there's an anterior mediastinal mass when it's gotten quite large. Uh, most of the time, small anterior mediastinal masses are going to be pretty imperceptible to you, like on each one of these chest x-rays, which we've labeled no finding. What are the imaging findings of an anterior mediastinal mass? Well, focal mediastinal bulge, if it's large enough and of the, in the right location to cause the mediastinal contour to be changed. But you can see how um, a smaller anterior mediastinal mass um, is really hard to pick up. The focal mediastinal bulge in these cases is pretty subtle. Diffuse mediastinal bulge or widening is another presentation of an anterior mediastinal mass in chest x-ray, but usually requires the mass to be unfortunately quite large before that um, is the way um, you're going to pick up something on a chest x-ray. And opacity in the retrocurrent sternal um, space is another potential presentation for an anterior mediastinal mass, but unfortunately um, not a terribly specific feature and sometimes not that sensitive either. There are probably one or two um, more sensitive um, imaging features on a chest x-ray that work uh, on rare occasions, but that requires the anterior mediastinal mass to be exactly in the right spot. So let's talk briefly about the anterior junction line, something we see often in folks who have hyperinflated lungs, people like uh, uh, folks with COPD. If you have an anterior mediastinal mass in the setting of someone who has an anterior junction line, you might recognize that something's not right uh, because the anterior junction line either is um, focally obliterated or focally thickened. Um, likewise, perhaps in some people, the aortopulmonary stripe may be a tip-off if there's an anterior mediastinal mass that's growing right there. Uh, but unfortunately, for the most part, um, most of our chest x-ray findings, um, most of our chest x-rays aren't that um, sensitive for helping us pick up an anterior mediastinal mass until it's become pretty large. Even when these masses are pretty large, sometimes it might be a little bit tricky to figure out even if it's in the anterior mediastinum in the first place. And so there's the hilum overlay sign, which can sometimes help. The way this basically works is um, even if you have a big mass on one side of a chest, if you can see the, the hilar vessels um, on that chest x-ray through the mass, 
That suggests that the hyalur vessels are outlined by air, and therefore the mass that you're perceiving is not a hyalur mass, but either mass anterior or posterior to the hilum. And so a hilum overlay sign is sometimes helpful in terms of uh, figuring at least to where a big mass is. But the bottom line is that the, um, the performance of chest x-ray for diagnosing anterior mediastinal masses is, is, is not optimal. And a lot of the times the presentation is going to be the first thing on the list here, nothing. CT um, certainly is much, much better at picking up the presence of an anterior mediastinal mass than chest x-rays are. But uh, once you've seen the mass, um, try to figure out what it is um, CT's not quite so hot at. People say that the first choice diagnosis for an anterior mediastinal mass on chest CT um, that radiologists offer is usually right half the time. So that's what we're up against. So how can we be the best we can be when trying to um, offer a reasonable differential diagnosis when we see an anterior mediastinal mass on chest CT? And if you ask most radiologists, they're going to come up with um, basically uh, three major, major features that they'll try to use to diagnose an anterior mediastinal mass. Calcification, fluid, and fat. Let's see how good calcification is. Well, calcification can occur in half the things on our list of anterior mediastinal masses. And what's more concerning, however, is it turns out that the pattern of calcification when it occurs in, in an anterior mediastinal mass is actually not that helpful. Um, there aren't that many specific anterior mediastinal mass calcification patterns. So, for example, this anterior mediastinal mass with a few eccentric small calcifications is a thymic cyst, whereas this anterior mediastinal mass with a few small eccentric calcifications is a thymic carcinoma. So, it turns out that calcification is a feature that is not all that helpful for rendering a specific diagnosis for an anterior mediastinal mass. How does fluid do? It turns out fluid actually is a viable um, imaging feature for us to rely on to try to render a more specific diagnosis for an anterior mediastinal mass. It doesn't seem promising at first because many of the disorders on this list can present with fluid. And when you consider that many anterior mediastinal soft tissue neoplasms can undergo cystic degeneration and form small pockets of fluid internally, that list gets even longer. Fortunately, however, when fluid presents in the setting of an anterior mediastinal mass, there's enough specificity in the different presentations to permit us to actually um, uh, winnow down the differential diagnoses um, from this large list. And that's what we're trying to explain in this table here. So it turns out that if you see an anterior mediastinal mass that, that contains fluid in the setting of recent chest wall violation, meaning trauma or perhaps surgery, the likelihood that anterior mediastinal mass is a seroma, hematoma, or abscess is much, much, much higher than all the other fluid-containing anterior mediastinal masses on that last slide. If that anterior mediastinal mass is mostly fluid and there's been no recent chest wall violation, there's a very, very high likelihood it's a thymic cyst, a pericardial cyst, or lymphangioma as opposed to all the other potential fluid-containing anterior mediastinal masses out there. And finally, if you've got an anterior mediastinal mass that contains fluid, and there's been no recent chest wall violation, and that fluid is only a small um, percentage of the whole mass because the rest is just soft tissue, then it's highly likely you're dealing with a thymic epithelial neoplasm lymphoma or non-seminomatous germ cell tumor that's undergone cystic degeneration as opposed to the, all the other fluid-containing anterior mediastinal masses on our list. So we can see that um, once we identify fluid and the setting in which it presents, um, that observation quickly allows us to pare down the differential diagnosis into something quite short.
one reminder, not all fluid is going to be zero to 20 Hounsfeld units like simple fluid. You're going to encounter peritonaceous fluid sometimes, which means that, um, like for example, this case right here, where this big cyst was isoattenuating the muscle on the CT. What that basically means is um, when you're dealing with an anterior mediastinal mass that's homogeneously um, higher in attenuation simple fluid, you may need an MRI um, before ruling in or ruling out fluid. All right, so fluid, helpful. How about fat? Fat's helpful too. There's only four diagnoses on this list that contain macroscopic fat. And these four diagnoses are very, very different in appearance from each other. And so once you've identified that there's macroscopic fat, you're going to have a pretty easy time of figuring out which of these four um, diagnoses is the explanation. Mediastinal lipomatosis is just an accumulation of fat within the anterior mediastinum, usually with straight um, margins, um, straight clean margins on both sides. Um, usually you'll find other um, areas of increased fat accumulation around the heart or along the pleura. Thymolipomas look very different than lipomatosis. Uncommon slow growing benign tumors that are usually huge when they're finally identified. Um, they have a very special look that's really different from everything else on this list. These fatty tumors contain some sort of soft tissue component, sometimes in the form of nodules, other times in the form of strands. Then there are teratomas, which look very different than lipomatosis and thymolipomas, um, often containing fat, sometimes fluid, sometimes calcifications too, but not always. And then there are morgagni hernias, basically a situation where there's a defect in the anteromedial diaphragm and stomach, sorry, abdominal contents herniate from the abdomen into the chest. So we got thymolipomas, teratomas, lipomatosis, and morgagni hernias there. So fat, also very helpful. Now we're going to encounter sometimes anterior mediastinal masses that contain no fat whatsoever and no fluid whatsoever. Um, which masses are those? These ones. So any of these um, disorders on this list that we've kind of listed now uh, could potentially present as a anterior mediastinal mass, um, one that has no fluid and no fat within them. And one of these lists, one of these um, disorders may look kind of funny to you. Um, that's thymic hyperplasia. It turns out that um, although 40% of cases of thymic hyperplasia present as just a normal looking thymus and another 40% look, still look like a thymus, just kind of thickened, um, 13 millimeters is usually the, um, the, uh, the number people use to kind of talk about thickened uh, thymus. One out of every five cases of thymic hyperplasia can sometimes present as a mass that sometimes may even, you know, um, may resemble, say, something like a thymoma. And so that's why thymic hyperplasia shows up on this list. Well, if you have a list that's this long, what do you do? Well, it turns out that the most helpful thing to do in terms of uh, being able to rank order your differential diagnosis is to know what the odds are. What's common, what's less common. And this is what... Um, our table um, tries to summarize here. The most common cause of an anterior mediastinal mass in virtually all age groups is lymphoma. Um, in these people, um, you may look for other sites of potential lymphoma in the chest or the rest of the body. Uh, take a look at the medical record for any evidence of B symptoms like fever, malaise, weakness. The number two and number three uh, most likely causes of an anterior mediastinal mass that contains no fluid, no fat, are thymomas and germ cell tumors. And the order of those um, alternates depending on if the patient's younger or older. In younger folks, germ cell tumors will probably be number two, thymomas number three, whereas in older folks above 40, thymomas may be number two and germ cell tumors number three. And then there's going to be a number of other 
potential explanations for an anterior mediastinal mass that contains no fluid, no fat, um, such as thymic carcinomas and carcinoids and stuff that are less common. All right. So now that uh, we've kind of had that conversation now, how do we pull this all together into a useful uh, clinical workflow we can actually use on a daily basis in the reading room? Well, it's a four-step process. And the way it works is whenever we encounter an anterior mediastinal mass, we're going to look for fat first. If we don't see any fat, we'll look for fluid. If we don't look for any fluid, we're going to look at stressors and we'll explain what that means in just a second. And if there are no stressors, and we're actually referring here to thymic hyperplasia, you'll see in a second, we're going to work with odds. So what do we mean by this? So if you see an anterior mediastinal mass, look for macroscopic fat. If there is macroscopic fat present, this anterior mediastinal mass is either like pomatosis, morgagni hernia, teratoma, or thymolipoma. If it's like pomatosis or morgagni hernia, you'll probably make no recommendation in your report. Whereas if it's a teratoma or thymolipoma, you're most likely going to make some sort of uh, recommendation for the patient to perhaps um, be referred to surgery. You'll recognize that the diagnosis is like pomatosis, possibly because you're seeing um, fat accumulation with sharp margins in the anterior mediastinum in the setting of enlarged pericardiac fat pads, increased subpleural fat. You're going to think about morgagni hernia when you recognize that there is an associated defect of the anterior medial diaphragm and perhaps abdominal contents or abdominal vessels in the anterior mediastinum. You'll recognize you're dealing with a teratoma um, because you're probably going to see something that's much more heterogeneous, perhaps circumscribed. And then thymolipomas are just going to be very unusual in the parents. Um, large fatty mass, really big, um, with either nodular or strands of soft tissue within that look nothing like a teratoma. If you don't see any macroscopic fat in this anterior mediastinal mass, you move on to step two. Look for fluid. If there's fluid, are we, are we seeing fluid in the setting of a patient with a, a fluid in the mass? Are we seeing this in the setting of a patient who's uh, recently had chest, wall, chest surgery or perhaps some sort of um, trauma to the chest? In which case, you think about seromas, hematomas, and abscesses. Um, these are usually managed clinically. Seromas and hematomas tend to be much more common diagnoses than abscesses on a number by number basis. If your patient is a patient who has seen no trauma or surgery to the chest, um, then you're kind of have to look at this anterior mediastinal mass and try to judge is most of this mass fluid or is it mostly soft tissue with small pockets of fluid? If this anterior mediastinal mass is mostly fluid, then you're going to be thinking about thymic cysts, pericardial cysts, and lymph or lymphangiomas as the more likely explanation. Thymic cysts are usually uniformly cystic with an imperceptible wall. Um, pericardial cysts um, have classic locations they tend to be um, found in. Lymphangiomas are much more rare. Uh, often large and uh, unilocular or infiltrating multicystic masses that like to encase things. If uh, you're dealing with uh, anterior mucinal mass that's relatively small pockets of fluid and a lot of soft tissue, then you're probably dealing with thymic epithelial neoplasms, lymphomas, and non-seminomous uh, germ cell tumors. Those are usually worked up by some combination of biopsy and or surgical referral. Step three, what if your anterior mediastinal mass has no fluid? Well, then you have to spend, step, um, step aside for a second and think, is there any possibility this could be a, a case of thymic hyperplasia presenting as a mass? 
Um, that requires you to think, well, um, is this the type of patient who might have a case of thymic hyperplasia? Have they seen chemo, radiation therapy, some sort of trauma uh, in the last year or so? Are they a patient with myasthenia gravis or lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, or graves? In those kind of settings, you have to consider the very real possibility this is thymic hyperplasia presenting as a mass. And in these kind of settings, um, there are certainly MR imaging sequences that help us rule in a thymic hyperplasia um, case. What if it doesn't look like your patient has thymic hyperplasia? Well, in this case, you're off to step four now. And now you will have to just go with the odds. What's your number one pick then? Lymphoma. What's your number two, number three picks? Thymoma, germ cell tumors. Again, uh, number two and three, um, the order of which will depend on the age of your patient. Um, certainly there are more uncommon diagnoses too. But the workup, the, the uh, recommendations generally going to be some sort of referral to surgery or for biopsy. But to reiterate, we understand these kind of situations uh, for just playing the statistics. The most common anterior mediastinal mass in virtually all age groups is lymphoma. And you're going to probably look for evidence of lymphoma elsewhere in the patient and whether there's any mention of B symptoms in the chart. Thymomas and germ cell tumors, we just said, are the most common anterior mediastinal mass or um, anterior mediastinal neoplasm after lymphoma. Um, thymomas, um, a third of patients with thymoma have clinical evidence of myasthenia gravis, weakness, pharyngeal dysfunction, diplopia. However, most other thymomas are clinically silent. So if you're dealing with an incidental anterior mediastinal mass, uh, you don't see any other evidence of disease and there's no B symptoms and the patient's over 40 years old, thymoma becomes a realistic consideration. Um, if it's not a thymoma and you're considering the possibility of a germ cell tumor, if the tumor is of uniform CT attenuation, seminoma is probably a more likely answer than non-seminomous germ cell tumors. Those tend to be more non-seminomous germ cell tumors tend to be more heterogeneous in appearance on CT. We can simplify this into what I quote unquote call the big picture radiologist um, version. And this is what it looks like. The differential diagnosis just gets compressed into seroma, hematoma, abscess, lipomatosis, morgagni hernia, thymic hyperplasia, and just tumor. And if you're going to play it, the big picture radiologist um, approach to this, same order of events. Step one, is there macroscopic fat? If there is, it's either lipomatosis, a morgagni hernia, a fat-containing neoplasm, or a fat-containing neoplasm. You should be able to tell the, all of which apart from each other. If it's not lipomatosis or morgagni hernia, just call it a fat-containing neoplasm and recommend a surgical consult. If the mass has no anterior mediastinal, if, if the anterior mediastinal mass contains no macroscopic fat, look for fluid. If there's been recent chest wall violation, describe it as a post-operative post-traumatic fluid accumulation and suggest some sort of clinical uh, workup. If the mass is not in the setting of recent chest wall violation, and there's only small amounts of fluid inside, call it a neoplasm, recommend biopsy or a surgical consult. If there's been no recent chest wall violation and the mass is almost all fluid, call it nonspecific mass and recommend an MRI. The MRI will most likely be nice, relatively definitive. If the anterior mustola mass has no fluid, remember, look for stressors that might suggest you're dealing with uh, thymic hyperplasia presenting as a mass, particularly if the mass is not aggressive in its appearance. C call it possible thymic hyperplasia. Suggest an MRI. If there's no reason to believe that this is a mass-like presentation of thymic hyperplasia, then you're probably dealing with a neoplasm and you're just gonna recommend a biopsy. There you have it. So that's the approach to anterior mediastinal masses.
Now, um, I would I suggest that uh, you um, click the link for viewing or downloading the slide deck for this particular talk, because the second half of the slide deck uh, contains 12 different cases of anterior mediastinal masses and tries to walk you through the approach that we've just kind of shared with you and uh, a few um, tips and little uh, few um, tidbits of facts along the way too.